Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, the General Manager of Hilton Colombo, Manish Fernando, is in the hot seat today as we take a closer look at Sri Lanka's hospitality sector. Then, Subhashini Abhaysinga, Head of Economic Research of Verite Research, discusses the importance of e-signatures and documents in improving Sri Lanka's international trade competitiveness. And LMD columnist Deshal Dimal wraps up the show with his take on Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. Today we are continuing our focus on the hospitality sector with emphasis on city tourism as well as the main challenges facing the conventional tourism industry and the impact of international hotel chains coming into the country. We've invited the general manager of Hilton Colombo, Manish Fernando, to chat with us on these and other related issues pertaining to the hotel sector. Manish, thank you very much for coming into Benchmark today. Just when you look around you, what are your perceptions of the tourism industry in Sri Lanka? Thanks, uh, Savitri, for the opportunity. My perceptions are always positive uh, since Sri Lanka has enjoyed uh, uninterrupted peace for so long. I think uh, the rest is in our hands to make it a big success. So you're a glass half full kind of guy. So if that is the case, what is the progress that you are seeing? I think lots of uh, progress has been made uh, in the city being a much more uh, habitable place and much more presentable place because lots of tourists who come in are really, really surprised, the first comers, uh, about how the city is and it's very, very, it's pedestrian friendly and there's lots of things to do. Uh, but I do see that there's lots of opportunity for Colombo to be something bigger than it is uh, with our rich uh, history. Uh, and comparing with uh, the regional uh, competition, I think lots to do. So should we be pitching against other city tourism destinations around us at least? Well, looking at it from a city point of view, it's, uh, it, you have to compete with everyone else, be it uh, Singapore or be it Thailand or be it KL. Uh, the regional cities in this area, which straight away come up to our mind, uh, so we need to compete with everyone else and we need to also offer something which is different uh, and yes we do. What should we have in place? What, is, what should be our differentiation? Tough question to answer just uh, uh, with my uh, humble experience but as a hotelier uh, and as someone who always goes to these cities I think we need to offer a lot more in terms of uh, night entertainment, in terms of nightclubs in terms of more restaurant options, more shopping options, because we still don't have uh, the large shopping centers. If you go into uh, Singapore, maybe it's the Eon Center, the uh, Takashimaya, to in Bangkok you take uh, the Siam Paragon or uh, Discovery Mall, or in KL you take the famous Twin Towers. So we don't have, on the shopping side, I think we have a lot to do. I think some of the Sri Lankan entrepreneurs are already working on those. I think when these come along with uh, uh, maybe a few more entrepreneurs, a few more hotels going into the night uh, club industry, which we had in the past, which was stopped due to all the uh, problem children uh, creating uh, problems in the nightclubs, which we had to stop running our nightclubs. I think if we get these under control, there's lots more we can do to offer to be competitive with the other bigger destinations in regionally. Manish, what are the main challenges that's facing the hotels in Sri Lanka? Savitri, uh, a hotel is not, I mean, a hotel is a place where people sleep in, uh, but there is lots more when you take a tourism uh, uh, product in terms of offering. From the time the aircraft lands in Katunayaka, the immigration officer, um, to the custom officer, to getting a taxi, the options we offer, to all the way coming to the hotel and going wherever in Sri Lanka and that whole experience, we must, until they leave from the airport, uh, we must look at that whole experience. Uh, it's not only a hotel, but it's to offer that whole, we must look at the whole cycle on how we are making people happy or how we are making people unhappy. If you look at, uh, uh, if you take a walk along Golf Face Green, 
you will see lots of touts uh, going with tourists and I don't know how many of the tourists are getting caught. You will see a lot of three-wheelers which are not uh, uh, authorized or maybe some are even authorized. They take people uh, on a ride and then they take them for a real ride by trying to sell things to them by force. So we've come across these things. Uh, so I think we need to look at that whole customer cycle and make sure that they are really, really happy by the time they leave Sri Lanka because you'll have so many people who will be going and talking positive about us and then you'll have more business coming back with good word of mouth. But if it's the other side, I think you will have people coming once and not coming back, then you're going to really, really kill yourself on the long run. So like you said, it's a holistic experience. So what can we do about it? Uh, is there enough collective industry uh, sort of groupings and discussion that will actually make that possible? I, I, uh, I, think, I think everyone's trying. I mean, you've got the Tourist Hotel Association to the minister uh, who regularly puts his uh, Facebook updates. I think everyone is really, really trying hard. Uh, but if you, you, we must really benchmark ourselves against other countries like Thailand uh, and countries like Malaysia. I remember when I was working in Malaysia, they had a program where they were on TV promoting Malaysians to be more friendly and to be smiling more. Uh, because they knew it has an impact on the tourist. So everyone's trying, but then there is much more I think we can do uh, by maybe at a higher level making people understand the value of a tourist, not just looking at them as a money tree, but as a human being, as a person, we should not lose our values and we should not forget our past uh, values in terms of looking after people hospitably uh, instead of looking at them as a moving money bank or something. Right. So lots more we can do to make sure that tourism in Sri Lanka is sustainable and not that it's a one-time thing. In what ways do you think new entrants into the hotel industry, what is the impact that they will have on the, on the tourism industry? For instance, we're seeing loads of international hotel chains coming up, just look around you, it's all here. Uh, well, how is that going to impact us? I think it's uh, going to be a positive impact because uh, if you look at chains, I mean chains came a long time ago, I think uh, I wasn't born probably by then. then. Uh, I think Pegasus Hotel was the Trust House Forte Hotel and then Intercontinental, which is now the K Kingsbury, were the first chains. Uh, then there was the Regent in the Golfers Hotel and then we had in the Cinnamon Grand the Oberoi. So they came long time ago and if you look at uh, the people who are holding positions, top positions even today, uh, when we came in the industry, when I came in the industry, those people who worked in those hotels were the ones who were holding the top positions and uh, they went after that they went out of the country and they became big people in those countries uh, thanks to all the training they got from all these chains so Sri Lanka is going to benefit when all these chains come in of course there's going to be more competition salaries are going to go up for people who are working in our industry because competition brings in uh, more fight to get the best people so lots of things is going to happen uh, in terms of uh, uh, a positive spin. Sri Lanka is going to be marketed much more. So when uh, when a Hilton comes, we have 4,700 hotels around the world. So it will show off in all our uh, selling uh, channels. Same way when a Hyatt comes in, or when the other chains come in. So it's to me, it's going to lift the standards in our industry. Of course, more competition. It might mean for the owner uh, less profitability. Uh, so they would have to focus more on uh, efficiency. Uh, and focus more on being more creative in marketing the destination. But overall, if you look at countries like Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, those countries have all gone from nothing to big time uh, destinations where Thailand was targeting 30 million tourists, Singapore city small destination but has marketed itself as a convention center uh, destination which is at about same I think. Uh, so lots fast to do. I mean we have got to 2 million I think or we'll get to 2 million, 2.2 million this year. Uh, so there's so much more potential uh, for us to uh, to do things. Uh, so it's going to all benefit when all these people are coming in. Obviously given the burgeoning tourism industry especially in city tourism and obviously wanting the market forces to determine the landscape, the minimum room rate removal, uh, how do you feel about that? Okay, this is a bit of a controversial uh, subject. Uh, I think the minister announced that minimum rates will not be removed for another two years. Uh, me personally, I'm a believer in uh, letting the markets determine uh, the pricing. At that time, 
minimum rates was brought in, I think something like 2008, 2009, it made sense because we only had a captive amount of tourists coming in uh, and actually majority were probably corporate people who came in to do business and others were visiting friends and relatives. They came anyway if there was a war or not. So by trying to kill each other at that time, uh, by having this minimum rate, it had a major benefit. But today, Sri Lanka is at peace and just like uh, every other industry, price is a major determinant of uh, how much people you can attract or how much you can sell. Uh, higher the price, maybe the demand falls, lower the price, the demand increases. So I believe we must let the market decide. And if you look at Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, they didn't have minimum rates. I worked in Vietnam, they didn't have minimum rates. They let the markets uh, decide. And when we had low periods, we used to uh, have the capability to bring the rate down and attract more customers. And when the high season came in, we used to charge double, triple and make more money. So me personally, I believe that we should free up markets. We should not try to uh, control markets because when you control markets, what happens is that there will be other effects uh, where there will be uh, advantages to uh, other industries, which if you take the apartments, the apartments are now benefiting. Uh, so you might have a massive boom in the apartment industry because people are now selling uh, apartments on their own on Airbnb uh, in an unregulated manner uh, and which is unfair competition versus all of us who are paying VAT and service charge and all that. So to me you should let, it's not that I don't, I'm against it, I mean people should have the right to sell whatever they want to sell it but you shouldn't try to control things and then uh, skew the market one way. Right, we'll be continuing this discussion, Manish. Later on in the program, Manish Fernando offers insights into the main development priorities for the industry in Sri Lanka as well as the emerging trends in the global sector. Stay with us. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. We understand that savings provide for life's special moments. That's why we were the first bank to introduce an incentivized savings scheme, Pathum Vimana. We changed how a nation felt about savings because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Thank you for staying with us on Benchmark. We are chatting about the tourism industry with Manish Fernando, General Manager of Hilton Colombo. So you've been out and about. What are the emerging global trends you're seeing for the hospitality sector? I think uh, something which is very, very close to everyone's heart is about sustainability. Uh, and lots of people are looking at when they go on a holiday or when they spend uh, money, are they doing it in a sustainable manner, which is being friendly to the earth and to the environment. I think this is something really, really big and something which is, it's, it's, it's not about business but it's about sustainability of our own lives for the future. Do you think the SLTA, the Sri Lanka Tourism Authority should get involved in, in ensuring that the industry itself is practicing ecotourism and insisting on sustainable practices? I think Sri Lanka Tourism Authority, I, I mean, they're doing a big job right I mean it's it's a it's a few people and today our industry is so big it's right around our country I don't think you can expect them to be controlling and making people do things but 
Uh, I think our entrepreneurs are very, very smart, our Sri Lankan entrepreneurs, and lots of them make business sense. Uh, so I think the business need will make it happen. And from a policy uh, framework, if you look at how expensive is fuel, how expensive is electricity in Sri Lanka, we have some of the most highest uh, unit rates. So it does make sense to be much more efficient. It does make sense to uh, bring your consumption of electricity per guest down and it will happen. Yeah. So, okay, if we need to reduce our carbon footprint, which is the order of the day, how can this green ethos be, uh, be actually fused into the hospitality industry? Like they say, charity begins at home. I think uh, it should start from the house and from the school. And if we really, really loved our nature and lived, loved our country in terms of what we breathe, what we drink, I think it will make lots of sense to the 21 million people in this country to look after the environment we live in. And it begins with yourself, not looking at the government for everything, not looking at the minister for everything, but it should start off from the most basic, basic unit, which is the family unit. And if we drove these values in, I think the rest will be much, much more easier. One of the biggest challenges being faced by the hospitality industry is the scarcity uh, of human resources. Are we actually dealing with it? I think, okay, again, this is my view, my personal view. Uh, I'm a second generation hotelier. My father was a hotelier, okay? And Sri Lanka has hotels. Golf Face Hotel is since 1868, okay? Mount Lavinia Hotel is another 150 years, I think. And then in Kandy, you have hotels which are over 100 years. Hospitality is nothing new to this country, okay? It's part of our culture, okay? So, I don't know why everyone is looking at the government every time, but it's in our hands in terms of the people who are running uh, this industry to train the next generation and to make sure they are remunerated properly so that we attract the younger people to come into our industry. There's a couple of people, a million people working in the Middle East, I think doing much more uh, uh, working as housemaids, working as... Uh, so these people, if we can attract them into our industry, I think we have a big opportunity in terms of helping our whole country. Because if you have the mothers all going abroad to work, then you have families which are all broken up. I think it's a big opportunity for us if we can train them to work in our industry. And I think even now, even at, as it is now, they can earn much more working in our hotels than working in the Middle East. But the thing is, how much can they save? And also there's a cultural aspect where some people don't like to do the same job they would do in Middle East. They wouldn't want to do it in Sri Lanka because of some kind of uh, cultural issues where people don't want to be seen doing such jobs. So we need to change the mindset. Uh, and with tourism, there's a lot more things people could do uh, in terms of uh, good jobs. Like if you take, if you go in Thailand, you go for a foot massage. And how many people, most of the therapists in Sri Lanka, you go to hotels, it's from abroad, from Bali or Thailand, right? So we have a cultural uh, mental block to doing this job. Uh, that's because of all the bad uh, connotations. But if we manage to change all these, there's, I think, another couple of thousands of jobs for people to do if tourism grew to its full potential. So no longer is that warm Sri Lankan smile sufficient to run a burgeoning tourism industry the way it is today. The traveler today is much more discerning. The millennials are much more traveled. The older generation are much more demanding. What is the skill set? that the new human resources uh, cohort should be having? You ask me some uh, pretty, pretty tough uh, questions to answer. I think in simple terms, this industry is one of the most simplest industries. There is no rocket science in this industry. And to me, the most important thing is your willingness to serve someone. If you are someone who does not take pride in serving someone, then you should not be in our industry how much educated you are. So if you are a person who is happy to serve someone else, we can train anyone to do any job in this industry and I am very, very confident. And my policy and my, my, or my belief, I always tell my team, do not go and poach from others. Train people, bring them from the villages and train them from the basics up to where they are and they will stick with you because they have learned from you. So it's not rocket science, it's a simple industry uh, and the most important basic, it's not a skill, it's from here. 
are you willing to make other people happy by serving them? If you have this, we can do it. So Manish, when you look around you, you're working in the trade, what is your vision for the hospitality industry in Sri Lanka? I'm a humble, I'm a humble, humble hotelier, okay? And I'm sick, but I'm second generation. My father was a hotelier as well. Uh, and I had the, I had the uh, chance to stay in hotels like the Goldfest Hotel where Mr. Cyril Gardiner and all these, the fathers of the industry uh, ran hotels, okay? To me, I remember from when I was like seven, eight years old, how we grew up in this industry. And I have lived in, in Africa, in like in Kenya, which is a super tourism destination. I've lived in England, I've lived in Australia, all around Asia. So there is no reason why we can't be great just like the other uh, destinations. And it's all to do with how we manage to manage our country in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of peace, if the infrastructure is developed and we manage to maintain our peace, I think we are in for very, very good times. Uh, and there's nothing which can stop us because we are smart people and we will adapt and we will uh, learn very quickly and we do learn very quickly. You go to Italy, you go to Middle East, you go to Australia. Sri Lankans are working in the kitchen, they're working in uh, in the restaurant, so we are very adaptable and we learn fast. So there is no reason why we can't make it big. Thank you, Manish. Keep the Thank Sri you. Lankan flag flying. Thanks, Savitri. Thank you. We've been chatting with the general manager of Hilton Colombo, Manish Fernando, and the discussion has been on the hospitality sector, the challenges that we are seeing, and also the trends that are emerging. On the other side, we have Anushan and Selvaraj. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Nearly 60% of all businesses in our country are SMEs. Some of our most growth-oriented financial solutions have been customized to serve this sector. That's why we have invested over 500 billion rupees to support the backbone of our economy. Because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Hello and welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushin Selvaraja. This week, we are going to focus on the importance of e-signatures and documents in increasing Sri Lanka's international competitiveness. So joining me is the Head of Economic Research for Veritary Research, Subhashini Abhay Welcome back to the show, Subhashini. Now, just to start off, give us a brief overview of the study. So basically, Verity Research approached this study because there was a lot of interest among the uh, importers and exporters about uh, paperless trade, how Sri Lanka can actually move away from having to submit manual documents to an entirely electronic communication with all the board agencies. However, this and the government has done quite a bit of investment in creating single window or electronic platforms but unfortunately, despite being able to submit documents electronically, the traders had to still take printouts and sign manually and submit because they were not willing to accept electronic signatures or electronic documents. And this created a problem because you have created systems that create uh, EC communication through uh, by using ICT. Unfortunately, the full benefits of this could not be reaped because you still had to print documents. And this is what compelled us to look into this study to see why do we still have to print documents when we have the facility to submit electronic documents. So what exactly is paperless trade and what are the benefits? 
So basically everyone wants to go into a paperless trade system because at the moment you have nearly 30 organizations falling under different ministries that have some say in import and export procedures. And there are various regulations that the traders have to comply with and various documents and data that you need to submit to these various organizations. So when you have to deal manually, you have to actually take these documents to the respective agencies, wait at these officers and get them signed off and sometimes actually they have to pay a certain amount of extra money to get the process fast tracked. So, but electronic communication prevents all that because you can communicate with the uh, agencies electronically from your office, you do not have to visit and it uh, reduces a lot of time and cost that you incur in getting all this uh, documentation processed. So that is the entire objective of going through a paperless trade and electronically uh, uh, communicating with the government agencies. So what role do e-signatures play in, uh, in, uh, in the paperless trade? What is critical for this system to function is that government agencies must be willing to accept electronic documents and electronic signatures without insisting people that they have to sign by pen uh, on a manual paper. So the idea, otherwise the whole objective of paperless trade or electronic windows is lost if they do not accept electronic signatures and, and at the moment that is the biggest bottleneck to get the full benefits of the system. So then Subhashini, what is holding back the implementation of e-signatures? That is a very interesting question because that's a question we had also because when we went into the research we realized we actually has the le had the legal framework, we had electronic transactions Act passed in 2006 which actually created the legal framework allowing government agencies to accept electronic signatures and not only that it supersedes all existing legislation that means even if your current act requires you to have manual documents the electronic transaction act basically make, takes away that requirement and says that's fine this act supersedes it because of that even if your act says you can still accept electronic uh, signatures. And uh, so there, and also you already have the single electronic platforms which can accept electronic documents. At the moment, we really do not see any bottleneck other than the government administration's lethargy to act on it. So to actually, there is, we have a culture in this country where you do not actually initiate things on your own unless you get a directive from the top. So right now, what we think is that that directive coming from the top saying, okay, these are the guidelines from tomorrow, all government agencies can accept electronic signatures and electronic documents and these are the, you know, basic criteria that you need to adhere to, we feel that will really be helpful. And just to tell you, while we are waiting and debating and discussing, it's interesting to note that India actually passed these electronic signature guidelines in 2006. Uh, seven years ago. So we are already too late and our traders and our trade competitiveness is, is uh, really suffering because of that. Thank you very much for joining us Subhashini. Thank you for inviting. That was Subhashini Abhisinga, Head of Economic Research for Verity Research. We'll be right back after a short commercial break with the latest on the economy. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Gami Pubudua, our microfinance offering makes it possible for the youth of this country who have a viable business plan but lack the funds to realize their dreams. 
We are committed to grassroots level entrepreneur development because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Welcome back to the show. I'm Anushin Selvaraja. Now for a closer look at the latest on the economy. Joining me is economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel. Welcome back to the show, Deshal. Now just to start off with, uh, how have the agricultural, industrial and financial services sectors performed so far? Yeah, this year has uh, been quite a tough start for the, for the entire economy, the first half in particular. Uh, we saw the second quarter of the year having quite a few set, setbacks for both agriculture and industry because of the floods. Um, that had a very, very significant impact um, across the board. Um, if you look at the first half, overall growth was about 3.87%, which has been, which is quite low compared to uh, what we have been used to uh, in the past. Dragged down quite significantly by uh, agriculture, naturally given the flood situation. The industrial sector as well, we saw a number of, uh, <coughs> a number of Sri Lanka's major industries are situated around the western province where the floods had quite a, quite a significant effect on several of these uh, industrial sectors as well. Uh, so both those sectors. <coughs> we saw being um, performing quite uh, in, a, in a fairly weak manner compared to historical averages in the in the first half. The services sector, however, saw a slightly uh, a better performance, led largely by the financial services sector, which saw one of the largest contributions to uh, aggregate economic growth in uh, the first half of uh, 2016. And also, sectors such as health and education have also seen some levels of growth. Um, in the first half as well. So really the economy has been taken forward in the first half by the services sector, whereas the drag has really come from uh, agriculture and industry. So what are the trends that we are likely to see, Deshal, and uh, what, are, what would be our growth prospects? Going forward, um, I would expect some kind of, uh, some degree of recovery in uh, agriculture, particularly as we see the, the, the effects of the floods that have now been, uh, have now been mitigated. Uh, in industry as well, we like to see some degree of recovery in uh, in the second half. Um, there's also likely to be a technical base effect, which should be quite uh, positive in the in the fourth quarter, which was uh, we saw fourth quarter 2015 growth being quite low. So therefore, there will be naturally a, a positive upward base effect in uh, for the entire economy in uh, the fourth quarter 2016. Uh, so in some, I'm expecting the full year growth to come in at about 4.5 to 5 uh, percent. Uh, which is a recovery from where we are right now at 3.8%. Uh, uh, um, there are still a number of headwinds that will be uh, will be affecting the economy. We would uh, expect the interest, high interest rates that we are seeing right now to prevail through the rest of this year and into the early part of 2017 as uh, well. So that is going to be uh, detrimental in terms of credit growth, detrimental in terms of uh, new, new investments and consumption activity also. So that will hold back particularly the service sector uh, to, to, uh, to some extent. And at the same time with the, with the budget uh, in that is expect that uh, would also be expected to have quite a few uh, tightening measures on the fiscal front, um, and also with the increases in VAT that that came into effect on the first of November. So all of those are going to also weigh down on consumption to some extent. The construction sector has been one of the one of the bright spots uh, in the first half as well. It did quite well, and expect that to continue to do well in the second half of 2016 and into 2016 also. Finally, Deshal, how is our external sector faring? Yeah, so the first half of the year again we saw this continued trend of uh, exports being uh, quite weak, about a 5.8% decline and this has been across the board. We've seen uh, from apparel to agricultural exports, uh, pretty much across the board there has been a fairly weak uh, performance in that. Um, in terms of imports, we've seen consumption imports coming down largely due to the, the tighter ma macroeconomic conditions uh, in the country. Uh, intermediate imports have remained uh, relatively flat, but on the investment related imports there have been, there's been some kind of uh, growth, which is a positive because it gives an indication of future investment growth in the economy and that is good for longer term uh, growth as well. Tourism earnings continue to, continue to be positive, remittances have been uh, fairly uh, fairly moderate as well, not, in a, not a negative that we saw in 2015. So uh, in general the current account of the balance of payments has been fairly favourable. Uh, the capital account has also been good until about uh, September. We've seen fairly, fairly good um, inflows of uh, foreign, foreign capital into Sri Lanka's debt markets in particular. Slight uh, tapering off of that in the last uh, couple of weeks, but I, would expect, uh, I wouldn't expect that to continue too much unless there is a very detrimental uh, uh, outcome from the, the Federal Reserve meeting in, uh, in November or in, in, like, most likely in December. Uh, <clears throat> but in general, I would expect the, cap the capital market was to, to remain reasonably positive um, going forward as well. Thank you for joining us, Deshal. Thank you, Anish. That was economist and LMD columnist Deshal D. Mel. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.